Hello there, witches. If you're on the lookout for a cozy read, you're in for a treat. I'm excited to introduce A Flytrap Fiasco by P.A. Mason, the prequel novella to the Trouble Down Under series. So grab your favorite spot, whether it's a comfy chair or a magical nook, and let's dive into this captivating tale. If you enjoy magical mysteries and a touch of mayhem, you're in the right place. Don't forget to hit subscribe, give this video a thumbs up, and share your favorite magical reads in the comments below. Let's begin. Chapter 1 I looked up from my product order and saw Pete was about to eat one of my customers. Man, come check this out. It's like straight out of a video game. Crap, I thought. Two customers, both with low riding jeans and stained t-shirts, hovered around my Dionea muscipula gigantis, more commonly known as a giant Venus flytrap. When they began waving their arms perilously close to its trigger hairs, my heart leaped into my throat. Careful, I piped up from behind the counter. It'll take your arm clear off if you get too close. Whoa, that thing is trippy. The shorter of the two swayed on his feet and snatched his hand away. The guy's eyes were red-rimmed. I held back a sigh. Running a hydroponics shop in California had its pitfalls. That certain kind of customer whose interest in gardening was limited to growing one plant in particular being one of them. What can I help you fellas with today? I gritted my teeth as I smiled, knowing full well what they were after. The cheapest hydro setup money could buy so they could start growing some Mary Jane in their closet. Well, the shorter one leaned over the counter and gave me what he must have thought was a dashing smile. How about you show us what you've got? It didn't take long to send the boys off with an armful of globes, pots, and hoses to get started. They balked a little at the price, but assured me they'd be by tomorrow to pick up some nutrients for their tomatoes. When the store was empty, I gave Pete a pat and tossed him a hunk of steak from the fridge. The carnivorous plant snapped it clean out of the air and clamped down to start on the long process of digestion. Perhaps it was a little foolhardy to keep a magical plant in the store. But so far, Pete's existence hadn't raised too many eyebrows, and he was certainly a talking point among the folks who came by. Besides, with our apartment building's rooftop terrace being the closest thing to a garden that I could lay my hands on in the city, I needed some space to keep my green thumb placated. I had to admit, though, the store was becoming more like a collection of horticultural curiosities. The far brick wall, which was ugly and stark when I moved in, was almost completely obscured in a tangle of verdant green. I checked each pot carefully, from my lightning bromeliad, devil's paw, philodendrons, and my current pet project, a fire lily which looked close to blooming bright red. Everything was in order, and the plastic tubs of fitting and hose on each stand was free of customers' litter and lost items. A few more pots with some Chinese evergreens and spider plants cheered up the front window underneath flashing neon signs. I stuck my finger in each pot absentmindedly to feel for moisture and check for any issues. Everything was under control in the plant department. It was time to get going. Flipping the light switch on the way out, I turned the closed sign on the door and locked up. The sun was glorious on my back, and I figured my boyfriend Damon would be off at the beach catching some waves. As much as I could have done with a little sea spray myself, there was paperwork to get through at our apartment, and I planned on getting up early to do a proper inventory of the shop. It was going to be so much easier when I could afford to get a little help, but in the meantime... Cat! I turned and blinked at the man outfitted in one of his usual Hawaiian t-shirts and sandals, his wispy gray hair standing at all angles like a cloud. Did I catch you at closing time? I glanced at my wristwatch. It was just after five, but turned to unlock the door again. Come on in, Randall. What can I get you? He was one of my best customers, after all. Despite the free spirit hippie look, it was his obsession with orchids that had him stopping by three or four times a week for supplies. Hoses and clay pellets. I have some bulbo film that... I knew I shouldn't zone out with my customers, but I also knew that Randall would tell me all about his latest acquisition at length and repeatedly. I waved him through the door as he nattered away and plastered a cheery smile on my face. 
After rounding up more than what he came for and tallying up a sizable order at the antiquated register, Randall stopped mid-sentence to peer closer at Pete. This one is rather remarkable, you know? Can't say I know much about them, but it would cause quite a stir at the orchid shows. With a bit of signage, a leaflet or two, you could drum up some business for this place. There's an exhibition this weekend. Business is just fine, Randall, but you feel free to bring along any of your buddies to come see Pete. I don't think he'd care much for being moved around in the back of my van. Randall nodded with a grave face and swiped his card. You should have seen my collection last time I did a show. The prize seemed hardly worth it afterward, with the flowers limp and the temperature fluctuating. It was hard to keep a straight face, but the man's enthusiasm for his orchids was something I could relate to. The fact he got out of the house once in a while to spend time with other people who shared his passion was more than I could say for myself. Well, maybe not with Pete, but maybe I could still drop by with some coupons? That sounded like something a good business person would do. I was going to do inventory tomorrow. I'll figure out what I can do a good price on. Great. He narrowed his eyes theatrically. But you make sure I get first dibs on the sale. I laughed, helped him get the purchases out to his car, and got the details of the orchid show. By the time I locked up again, it was getting close to six, and I puffed out my cheeks as I pulled out of the laneway in my van. Getting used to life in the city was tougher than I thought it would be, and the traffic on the way home looked like it was going to be brutal. It used to be so much simpler when home was a five-minute drive on a dirt track from what passed for a town in Arkansas. But then, it had been pretty boring, too. As I crawled closer to our apartment, the smell of the sea crept through my AC vents, and if I had my swimsuit handy, I would have detoured. It was Damon's job with his family's property firm that had us living in such a sought-after location close to the beach, and I could only dream about affording rent for a shop close to home. Not that I minded. I wanted to prove I could stand on my own two feet and make something of myself. After pulling into our underground garage and trekking up the stairs to our apartment, I let myself in to find Damon was absent. I chalked it up to either a late night at the office the family business was involved in a nasty lawsuit, or a surf that was too good to pass up, even if daylight was dwindling. But he could have called, at least. What took you so long? Gus, my ginger feline familiar, glared from his perch on the back of the slick leather sofa. Oh, you know, working to earn a living. I smirked and grabbed a can of his favorite chow from the cupboard. So I can afford this top shelf stuff. Gus licked his chops and pounced onto the rug. Not much good to me if you're not home in time for dinner. Thought Damon would be home by now. I bent to tap the seafood pate into a bowl hand-painted with colorful fish. It's not like you can't get into the kibble. That stuff is wretched, Gus said around a mouthful of food. And so is that mail of yours. I refrained from rolling my eyes, but couldn't help the sigh that escaped my lips. Gus wasn't taking to the city lifestyle very well and blamed his misery on Damon. Don't be such a grouch. Did you see Mimi today? The fluffy white cat from downstairs had Gus in a tailspin, even if she didn't possess the cognizance of a familiar. While he pretended he wasn't interested, he couldn't help but tell me all about her when he let his guard down. Pa! he spat. I saw her smooching up to some ragged tomcat yesterday. Ouch! And here I was thinking Mimi may have been the key to getting Gus around to the idea of staying in California. That's too bad. Maybe we should try to find a cat cafe this weekend. There's plenty of fish in the sea, you know. Don't be patronizing, Gus grumbled. We should pack our things and head home on the weekend. I sense trouble, and in a big way. A familiar's job was to look out for their witch or warlock, but I wasn't buying into the dire warnings not with his agenda to leave from the minute we'd arrived. Not going to happen. Now I've got more work to do, so I'll leave you to your dinner. Fortunately, the seafood pate won out, and Gus ignored me as I grabbed a granola bar from the kitchen. Worrying about his sulking was on my list of priorities, but socializing on the weekend would hopefully take his mind off being spurned by Mimi. I fired up my laptop and sank onto the sofa to the dreary work of accounts, doing my best to ignore the stunning view of the horizon from my window. Tallying up numbers was harder with mild dyscalculia, 
dyslexia except with numbers. I was sure my accountant hated me. All the pre-formatted spreadsheets in the world couldn't save me from swapping digits as I painstakingly moved amounts around. A proper point of sales system was on the list of things to do, just as soon as I got ahead on supplier invoices. I was almost through my shoebox of paperwork, with Gus curled into a food coma beside me, when my cell phone rang. I startled at the interruption. Hello? There was no caller ID, and I blinked at the night sky out the window. Where had Damon gotten to? Yeah, it's Steve from All Hours Security. Just a courtesy call to let you know we've had an alert from your system. We can head over and check it out for you, but we'll need prior approval. Yeah, and get charged a princely sum for Pete having ticked off the motion sensors, or a tremor that knocked something over. Thanks for letting me know. I'll go take a look myself. Just be careful now, Steve warned. If it looks like anyone's inside, you go ahead and call law enforcement, won't you? Of course. I pushed down a wave of irritation. Thanks for the call. The security system at the shop was a legacy from the pawnbrokers who'd been there before me. And it was dated, to say the least. I'd considered leaving the thing off entirely, but Damon had warned against it. I supposed he was right. The insurance company would have a field day if I got broken into with no security. What was that? Gus yawned and blinked sleepy eyes beside me. Leaving again. Just the alarm at the store. I scratched his fuzzy cheek. I'll be back soon. Damon will probably be home before me. Gus mumbled something I didn't quite catch and snuggled back down to sleep. Damon. I frowned and dialed his number, but it went straight to voicemail. I shot him a text to let him know I was heading back to the shop and brewed a coffee to go before heading to the van. At least the trip back was quicker with rush hour traffic well and truly off the road. But when I pulled out onto the strip where my shop sat between a Chinese takeout and laundromat, flickering blue and red lights awaited me. Crap. My heart hammered in my chest. Police vehicles sat right out front of the store, and with tape spanning the footpath around the entrance, I knew it wasn't just a regular break-in. Chapter 2 My first thought was that Pete had eaten an intruder, probably the stoners who'd been in earlier that day. Then I panicked at the thought of what would happen if that got on the news. Grandma would be pissed. The prospect of a crow caught in breach of magical law would shame her to her very core, and maybe even jeopardize her position on the arcane council. I pulled up at the curb and gulped as I wrenched off my seatbelt. Cool. I had to be cool. But when I hopped out of the car and leaned over the police tape, a bored-looking officer approached with his hand up. Ma'am, I'm going to have to ask you to stay back. But this is my shop. I backed up a step. I had a call from security. What happened? I'm afraid this is a crime scene. He plucked a notepad and pen from his back pocket. I'll need to see some ID and get your phone number. The detectives will be in touch with some questions. They'll let you know when you can get access to your premises. What? When I can get in? My mouth hung open and I clicked my teeth shut. Everything was running through my mind at once. Standard procedure with a homicide. Your ID, please. Homicide? I rummaged in my purse for my driver's license and recited my cell phone number carefully in a trembling voice. I was sure I must have messed it up, but I was saved from worrying about whether I'd messed up the digits when a guy in a navy suit wearing a lanyard strode over and traded words with the officer. You're the owner, he raised his eyebrow. It was probably wrong to notice the guy was cute when there was a dead body inside my establishment. A dead body among an oasis of magical plants but his dark features and roughly tousled hair were rather striking. His eyebrow continued to rise, and I croaked as I opened my mouth to speak. Yeah, um, what happened? I got a call from security, and I suppose I should have let them deal with it, but I figured it was just the alarm acting up again, and I'm Detective Swan, that big plant with the teeth. I don't suppose you have a way to get it to let go? Pete, I gasped and held a hand to my mouth. My worst fears realized. Tears sprang from my eyes. I assure you, he didn't mean it. I fed him right before closing and made sure I locked the doors. It's, uh, got a hold of some evidence. I blinked, the words taking a few seconds to settle in my mind. Evidence. 
I was pretty sure if the said evidence was a body, he would have said something. Sure, I cleared my throat. I can get him to cough it up. Detective Swan held up the police tape as I ducked under and stayed behind me as I strode cautiously to the front door. The top pane of glass in the door had been busted inward, and the detective swung the door open for me as I hesitated. No need for you to go bleeding on the crime scene, he quipped. Crime scene. My brand new business venture had turned into a house of horror. And there I was thinking the grass-smoking customers were the worst undesirables I could expect. I mumbled something in the affirmative and cast my eye around the ruined display stands. Whatever happened here had been a real struggle. A yelp brought me out of my reverie, and I wound my way around the debris to find a woman in a business shirt snatching her hand back from Pete's gnashing maw. She screwed her face up as she saw me, then focused on Detective Swan. Who's this? She grunted. Cat, I said. Katerina Crow, I'm the owner. Nice place you've got here, the woman rolled her eyes. Mind getting your fly trap to back off? The woman's attitude grated on me, but I blew out a breath and nodded. She backed away and around a covered mound on the ground, presumably the body, and started chatting with an officer handing an armful of bags. Don't mind Detective Cruz, Swan said. Took the wallet straight out of her hand. Can't say we run into meddling plants that often. A nervous giggle escaped my throat, and I was struck by how out of place it sounded. Pete's a rare one. A wallet probably still smells like steak to him. Not to mention a wayward hand. But I wisely kept that tidbit to myself. The trap responsible for the evidence was easy to pick out. It was the only one clamped from the five that grew on sturdy stalks. I was painfully aware of Detective Swan watching me and opted to grab some meat from the fridge to keep the empty traps busy while I used a little magic to have Pete relinquish the wallet. Steak or no, I could have made the carnivorous plant cough up, but I was already walking a fine line if I wanted to keep both my magic and my plants from further scrutiny. With a flourish, I tossed the hunks up into the air and reached for the culprit trap to give it a disciplinary sizzle. Its jaws sprang open, and the wallet fell to the floor with a slimy smack. That thing is a sight. Detective Swan donned a glove and stooped to collect the evidence. His partner strolled over with a scowl, and I shrugged. Pete's mostly harmless. Thought he'd be a bit of an attraction for the customers. A plant with a name. Detective Cruz nodded slowly. Of course it is. Now, while we have you in here crowding up the crime scene, you might as well answer some questions. After getting out of the way of the folks photographing every conceivable surface in my store, I slumped onto a stool behind the counter and recounted my movements for the evening. Sure, Cruz scribbled notes into a folder. I'll need you to come in to give a formal statement, but that won't be for a few days. Any chance of bringing up some footage? I blinked and followed her gaze to a dummy cam in the corner. Afraid not. Those things are just deterrents. I was getting around to replacing the security system. A flash of irritation crossed her features and she huffed. That'd be a good idea. I imagine your customers are on the seedier side. Aha, uh -huh. she thought I was a dope peddling lowlife. Most of my customers are upstanding citizens. My voice was tart. But I can give you a list of who was in here today. I reached for my receipt book and thumbed through pages of duplicates. Huh. Swan's eyes widened. Haven't seen one of those in years. You haven't gone digital? He pointed to the computer on the counter. Half the time it doesn't work. The other half, the Wi-Fi drops out. I pointed to the name on the first receipt. Randall Lockhart came by at the end of the day. Before that, a guy named Steve Maynard. The detective shared a look and Cruz peered over her folder. Anyone else? Ah, no, it was a slow day. Okay, Cruz snapped her folder shut. That's all we need from you right now. Someone will call you when we're done. Who was it, by the way? I chewed my lip and glanced at the covered body. Detective Cruz nodded to Swan and he rubbed his nose. ID isn't confirmed, of course, but we believe the deceased is Robert Maynard. Does that name sound familiar? The name niggled somewhere in the back of my mind, but all I could think of was the chances of two Maynards in my store in one day. One dead, and the other, in Cruz's words, a seedier type. I, uh, I'm not sure. This is all a bit much, you know? 
My eyes wandered to the covered mound on the floor with a coil of hose and a ruin of kinks beside it. Maybe I should get out your hair. Swan nodded, and Cruz turned to bark at someone hauling plastic bags out the door. Bags filled with my products by the looks. I glanced around again, focused on the far wall behind the body and on the uppermost shelf. A bare space caught my attention. Excuse me. I sidled past Swan and skirted the body as I stared up at the shelf. Of all my magical plants, the singing fire lily was probably one of my greatest achievements. A specimen which I'd painstakingly taught to vocalize, and it was missing. Is there anything out of place? Swan looked between me and the shelf with keen interest. I could hardly tell the man someone had stolen my magical lily capable of pumping out a power ballad. But even worse, it painted the murder scene with elements which could land me in big trouble with inquisitors, the council's hounds. Ah, no, I forgot I sold that one a few days ago. I giggled again, sounding more than a little unhinged. It's really been a long night. I should just go. Swan's facial expression was sympathetic, but there was something in his eyes that told me otherwise. He was sus on me, and no wonder. Is there anyone we can call for you? To come pick you up? Ah. I checked my phone, but Damon still hadn't answered my text. No, it's fine. Do you guys need my keys or something? No, we'll patch that door up and lock it on the way out. Someone will be in touch to let you know when we're done. It'll be a few hours yet. I nodded and strode out of my store, bile rising in my gut. It was the strangest feeling, leaving a body and a gang of crime scene officers milling around in my place of business. I considered turning back and insisting on taking my plants home, but figured that would only draw more attention. So long as Pete kept his traps to himself and my lightning bromeliad kept its sparks in check, everything would be fine, except for the fact a murder had taken place. I climbed into my van and gripped the steering wheel as I sucked in deep breaths. It was time to get home, take a hot shower, and pray that by morning, the police had caught the culprit. After that, I could go about recovering my fire lily. When I got through the door of our apartment, Damon's absence really gnawed at me. It was unlike him to be so MIA without a word. But the trouble with the lawsuit at the office had him working extra hours, and I wondered vaguely if I'd forgotten some event he could be at. I'd learned rubbing elbows with wealthy folks was all part of the game when it came to building apartment towers, even if they were usually a snooze fest when he asked me to come along. It made a certain kind of sense, though. Damon's talents with glamour made him the perfect face for the family business. Charm oozed from the man's pores regardless if he was using magic or not. Smothering a yawn, I changed into my coziest pajamas and crawled into bed, hoping a brand new day would bring better tidings. Chapter 3 I woke to the smell of pancakes, and it took a moment to recall the train wreck of a day that ended with a dead body. But pancakes meant Damon was home, so I climbed out of bed, leaving a snoring Gus behind, and hiked my hair into a ponytail. Hey. Damon smiled as I padded out into the kitchen and flipped a steaming pancake onto a plate. The sight of him in his shirt without a tie, not quite ready for the day's work, was something I reckoned I could appreciate for the rest of my life. Especially when he was making me breakfast. Morning. I slid onto a stool at the marble counter and rubbed my eyes. What's this? Where were you last night? And do I hear the washing machine going? Laundry wasn't Damon's strong suit, but he gave me a long, suffering look anyhow. We had a meeting with the lawyers last night. Dad was pretty worked up after. But what about this break-in? Sorry, I left my phone in the car. I didn't want to wake you when I got back. I cradled my head in my hands and tried to figure out where to start. When Damon nudged a mug of coffee toward me and tucked a stray strand of hair behind my ear, I took a grateful gulp and sighed. After recounting the events and begrudgingly admitting my fire lily was stolen, Damon's eyebrows looked about ready to fly off his brow. You had magical plants in the shop? Jesus, cat, this is bad. Oh, and a dead body isn't? I took a bite of my rapidly cooling blueberry pancake and shrugged. I needed some space to do my thing. I never thought anybody would steal one, much less kill over it. Besides, you're allergic to lilies. 
Damon dropped the skillet into the sink and rubbed a hand over his face. You could have just asked. We have warehouses all over the city. There was no need to open a store so you could play gardener. My mouth hung open, and I wondered why he was being such a jerk. I'm building a business, Damon. You asked me to move out here with you, and there was no way I was going to sit around like a bum. Besides, I will not spend the next 20 years selling supplies. If I want to get good enough to start a magical nursery, I need to practice. Fine, he shook his head. But now we have a big mess to clean up. We don't need inquisitors crawling up our asses. Who was the guy? The guy. Oh, the dead guy. Someone called Robert Maynard, they think. I chewed my lip trying to figure out why the name sounded so familiar. You've got to be kidding me. Damon leaned back against the counter and ran his hands through sandy blonde hair. What? Bobby Maynard? The guy who's taking us to court? Damon made an isn't that obvious face, and recognition dawned in my mind. I'd once rubbed elbows with Bobby at a fancy party, one of very few people I'd been able to have a proper conversation with. The polite and awkward smiles I got from uptight millionaires when I told them I ran a hydroponics shop had been thankfully absent with Bobby. He'd chewed my ear off on the subject of orchids for what had seemed like hours at the time. But then he'd had a bitter falling out with Damon's family, the Carringtons, and filed a lawsuit as the primary investor in one of their biggest projects. So what the heck was he doing in my store? Oh no, I rubbed my temples. Damon, was he a warlock? Damon frowned and shook his head. Not to us, he wasn't, and he and Dad went way back. Then what kind of interest could he have possibly had in my store? I don't know, Cat, but this is bad news. I mean, the lawsuit will disappear, but there's going to be uncomfortable questions to answer. He grabbed his pinstripe suit jacket from the back of a dining room chair and pulled it on. I better get to the office and let everyone know. I opened my mouth to protest, but clicked my teeth shut. It was me who had the problem to deal with. But as the facts straightened out in my mind, I saw how bad it looked. The guy who filed a lawsuit ends up dead in the defendant's girlfriend's place of business. Crap. I pushed my plate away and took another healthy gulp of coffee. I'll see what I can do in the meantime. Someone was supposed to let me know when I can get the store back, but I'll head over and see if I can find anything the police might have missed with the plants. Damon nodded and brushed his lips across my forehead as he picked up his keys. Let me know if you do. I watched a little forlornly as he picked up his briefcase and left the apartment. It would have been nice to have a little backup, or at least a shoulder to cry on, but he was right about my indulgences at the shop. We could both end up in a lot of hot water over the whole mess. After showering and checking my messages, I got dressed and headed back down to the van. Someone from the police department had called to let me know they were done with the crime scene, and I wondered if random folks were wandering around my shop on account of the door being busted. That early in the morning, traffic was light, and I was relieved to find the empty glass pane secured with a broken piece of chipboard and duct tape when I arrived. That didn't stop the rubberneckers, though, and I scowled as I approached. What happened, Cat? Mrs. Murphy had a basket of laundry under her arm. She came by every Thursday, and more than once passed the time by poking around my store as the dryer rattled against our shared wall. Others looked at me with open curiosity, and I cleared my throat. There was a murder last night. The collective intake of breath had my cheeks burning with embarrassment, and I wished they'd all just go away. Pa, Mrs. Murphy shook her head. This neighborhood is going to the dogs. Others murmured their agreement, and I squeezed past to let myself in. I closed the door firmly behind me and swept aside a pile of glass with my boot. The store still looked like a bomb had gone off in it. With a sigh, I went out the back to grab some trash bags and a broom, and then went about the business of cleaning up the mess. After hours of sweeping, making notes of items that had to be thrown in the trash, and writing stands that had strewn hoses and fittings over every conceivable surface, I sank to my stool behind the counter and groaned. The place still wasn't anywhere near up to snuff. The dumpster out the back was close to overflowing, and I knew I'd be finding stray pellets of perlite in every nook and cranny for months. I picked up the phone to make the inevitable call to the insurance company, 
and closed my eyes when cheery hold music blared on the other end. With my scrawled list of stock in front of me and thinking about how much was in evidence bags, I used the opportunity to tap on the calculator. When an operator picked up the call, I started explaining. After describing the situation, the operator made one of those polite exclamations and said, Oh dear, now, I'm afraid we can't process any claim until they complete the police report, and with it being a murder, well, I wouldn't get your hopes up about it being quick. In the meantime, I can send you some paperwork to fill in. I refrained from screeching over the phone. Of course, it was going to be like that. It was an insurance company. After giving over my credentials a second time, the operator assured me that the documents would be in my inbox any minute and told me to have a nice day. Unlikely. It was going to take a lot of work to get the place up and running again, and I'd have to replace some stock from my own pocket. Had my business venture seemed so close to tanking just months after opening was devastating, but I chided myself for my first world problems. At least I wasn't the one who was murdered with only magical plants for witnesses. Frowning at my collection, I wandered over to check the water levels and pots. Everything was in order, but Pete seemed somehow droopier than usual, probably too much steak. In my effort to bamboozle Detective Swan, I'd unwittingly put my flytrap into a food coma. I was doing a little light pruning on my taka plant, probably more for my calming benefit than any real need, when a tap came at the door, and I spun in surprise. If it was a gawker, I was of a mind to give them a sharp word or two for sticking their nose in where it wasn't wanted. But when I swung open the door, it was Randall loitering on the footpath, wringing his hands with concern etched on his features. Cat, what on earth happened? He nodded to the patched window, which only reminded me I hadn't called the glass fitters yet. My shoulders sagged, and as annoying as Randall could be, I thought I could use someone to listen for a while. Come on in, Randall. I'm afraid there was a murder here last night. A what? Randall recoiled, then tilted his head to look past me. That's terrible. I hope it's nobody you knew. I stepped back to let Randall in, and he took in the damage as he scanned the room. Ah, well, I'm not sure if I should say anything. The identity hasn't been confirmed as far as I know, but they believe it was a guy called Robert Maynard. I locked the door behind us and tried to recall if my conversation with Bobby had included Randall given their shared interest in orchids. Do you know him? Bobby? Randall spun on his heel and stared at me. Bobby Maynard? Well, sure, he and I go way back. The orchid enthusiast community is only so big, after all. I hugged my shoulders and studied Randall's face. He seemed genuinely shocked. You wouldn't have happened to tell him about the store, would you? I don't think he ever came in here, and I have no idea why he would have ended up dead in my store. Hmm. Randall rubbed his chin and his bushy eyebrows knitted together. I couldn't say. Of course, I talk up the store all the time with the society. But whether I told him directly, he shrugged. What, uh, was the cause of death? I stared blankly for a second, then wondered why I hadn't even considered that. I'm not sure. By the time I arrived, the body was covered up. I see. Randall looked around again and heaved a deep breath. Well, it's a damn shame is what it is. Bobby was a great guy. You two were friends? I ventured. Sure, I guess we didn't send each other Christmas cards, but there's something to be said for knowing someone for that many years. I felt a little bad questioning him, but there didn't seem like much else to say. I'm sorry for your loss. I'll have the store up and running in a few days. Do you need anything? Nah, Randall waved a hand. I was just passing by and saw the door. You should really call someone to come and fix it for you. I sighed and gave a lopsided smile. It's on the list. After assuring me he'd be by in the next few days, I saw Randall out and rubbed my aching head. The situation was a hot mess of coincidence. The victim was suing my boyfriend's family, a longtime pal of my best customer, and shared a last name with another. How I was going to get to the bottom of things and recover my fire lily was beyond me. But first things first, I needed new glass in my door. Chapter 4 
With a lot of elbow grease and some improvising, I flipped the open sign the following day. Part of the decision came down to refusing to spend another day freaking out by myself, but I also knew I'd need to make some serious sales to cover costs until the insurance came through. Damon had come home late the night before, and we'd only traded a few words on what we were both up to before he crashed. It didn't look that bad. But then, it was a far cry from the usual well-ordered shelves. I'd yet to comb through each tub of fittings to make sure they were the right size, and I knew I'd have to rewrite the price tags sooner rather than later. I wasn't all that surprised when more customers than usual streamed in and was grateful when most made token purchases to make up for the fact they were there to snoop. I was writing out a receipt for one such customer when he asked, so did it have to do with some kind of drug war? I gave him my best resting bitch face look and snapped the receipt out of the book. I assure you this establishment does not cater to drug dealers. The victim was an upstanding citizen and his death had nothing to do with this store. Not that I knew of anyhow. Who was it? The guy leaned a little closer, his eyes overly bright. I closed my eyes and took a calming breath. I'm not at liberty to say, but I'm working closely with the detectives on the case and am providing full cooperation on which customers may be of interest to them, Mr. Ah. Uh... I glanced down at the receipt. Hayes. The guy swallowed and scooped his purchases from the counter before hightailing it out the door. A few other people who were loitering avoided my gaze as I stared at them, and within a few minutes, they'd all cleared out. Perhaps opening hadn't been the best idea after all. For the hundredth time since seeing the red and blue lights flashing out the front of the place, I wondered if running a hydroponics shop had been a naive venture. My preference would have been a regular nursery, but to get the space and supplies for that sort of operation had been well and truly out of my reach. I'd told myself the place was a stepping stone, a way to get by until I had the skill to craft truly spectacular plant species. With arcane laws on sharing magical items with regular folks being so rough, it limited the market for singing flowers and giant fly traps to witches and warlocks. And Manuel Augustine had that covered. His craft was amazing, and I knew my attempts at magical horticulture paled in comparison to his empire. I was reminiscing on the octopus flower centerpieces at the inaugural council gala, the ones that actually swayed in time with the music, when my thoughts were interrupted. The door swung open and I smelled them before I saw them. The two stoners from the day of the murder. Well, hey guys, I smiled politely. Good to see you back so soon. What happened here? The taller one, I didn't have his name on the receipt, wrinkled his nose. I watched Steve Maynard closely and sighed. Had a break in the other night, but I still have plenty of stock for you boys. It was nutrients you were after, right? Steve cleared his throat and sidled up to the counter. Well, uh, our little operation has just gotten bigger. I blinked, confused. Pardon? We'll need more. He twirled his finger in the air. Supplies, for the tomatoes, you know. Money won't be a problem. He winked, and I tried to keep the revulsion from my face. Sure thing. Do you need some help putting together plans for a system? They both looked at me a little blankly, and I pulled some catalogs from under the counter. Depends how big you're talking, but it might be better to buy a few kits which you can configure together. After explaining their options slowly and sketching some plans onto a scrap of paper, Steve scratched the back of his neck and nodded. I'll take 20. My eyes boggled, and I narrowed my eyes at the pair. You've gone from three pots to wanting 200 in the space of two days. Fortune's a strange thing. Steve held his arms out in a magnanimous gesture. Two days ago, I didn't know I'd be stumbling onto this kind of luck. Luck? I wasn't sure I wanted to know. But I didn't want to shell out to order that much stuff if there was a chance I'd get stiffed. I'll have to contact the suppliers. And for an order that big, I'll need a 30% deposit. Man, I told you. The taller one rolled his eyes and sagged theatrically. When my grandma died, it took forever for the inheritance to come through. Inheritance? Steve shifted and glared at his friend. I, uh, haven't got the money yet. Someone passed? I tried to keep my face sober, but
but the pair didn't look a bit put out. Yeah, my uncle. He didn't have any kids, so I figure he's left me a piece. Sorry to hear that. My mind turned a million miles an hour. Say, I don't suppose those detectives caught up with you? They rewarded my question by backing up a step with wild eyes. About the break-in? I don't know what you're talking about, lady. I haven't broken in nowhere, the taller guy said. Course not, I waved a dismissive hand. It's just with the murder and all. I would have thought the detectives would have been pretty thorough. Murder? The tall guy raked fingers through his hair. Steve stood staring dumb at me, and I thought I'd press a little further. Strange thing is, he was a Maynard too. Bobby Maynard. Do you know him? What? It was close to a shriek, and the tall guy clapped Steve on the shoulder. Your uncle got wasted here. Steve just blinked, and I thought the guys were either the dumbest souls I'd come across in a long time, or were doing a ridiculous job of covering their tracks. I don't know, Steve protested. Mom didn't say. Who'd have thought that guy grew? The tall guy blinked at me. Then synapses appeared to fire behind his eyes, and he thumped Steve on the chest. Maybe that's why your mom said the cops came looking for you. That was skirting a little too close to an accusation, and I didn't want to learn that Steve was a murderer without plenty of witnesses in close proximity. Well, I'm sorry to have broken the news to you boys. It must be very upsetting. I chewed on my lip, wondering how delicately to ask my next question. Now for this order. I don't have an address, and it would make sense to have these shipped straight to you. Steve shook his head slightly and eyed me askance. Never mind. We'll come back another time. I fought a wave of irritation as they left the shop and fretted over the new piece of information. Steve had been in the store on the day of the murder and stood to gain from Bobby's death. What were the chances? But it seemed like Steve didn't even know the guy. There wasn't a shred of emotion on his face when he spoke about him, but that could just add to the argument that he was some kind of psychopath. But what would a stoner want with my singing fire lily? As much as I tried to convince myself that it made sense, I couldn't reconcile with that pea brain hatching a plan like that without getting caught red-handed. If only I could call mom. She'd know what to do. Except she wouldn't be able to keep it from grandma. And if she found out, nothing would stop her from coming to Callie herself to flay me for it. But she always said there was a magical solution to most problems. And if I could just figure out what that was, Aunt Tabitha... Great aunt, that is. If there was one family member who wasn't cowed by my grandma and had my best interests at heart, it was her. Pity she was all the way down in Australia, but I picked up the phone nonetheless. I only thought about the time difference as the phone kept ringing, but when I was about to hang up, a muddled voice came from the end of the line. Is that you, Kat? I haven't got my glasses on. Good grief, what time is it? Has somebody died? No, I suppose not, or I would have seen it. Let me just, Aunt Tabby. I smiled, despite myself, warmed at hearing her voice. I'm sorry to have woken you. Never mind, dearest, what's the trouble? In halting sentences interrupted by Aunt Tabitha dropping the phone and making a pot of tea, I laid out the events of the past few days in detail and finished with the question that was burning in my mind. Is there a way to find out who did it, to see it? I heard her sipping her tea on the other end. Then she chuckled softly. Goodness, no, I'm a seer, dear. The past isn't my business. The future is mine to see. And you didn't get any kind of warnings? I thought about the time, back in Arkansas, Aunt Tabby had called to insist I didn't drive to work. It had been a good move. A truck had overturned on the road I usually took, and I could only guess at what would have happened if I hadn't heeded her warning. No, Aunt Tabby clucked. If I got a vision for every schmuck that got himself killed, I wouldn't get a wink of sleep. I smothered a giggle and closed my eyes. Hearing her voice was so good. For the first time in days, I felt actual cheer. So what should I do? Can you tell me if I solve the case? There was a pause on the line, and I wondered for a second if Aunt Tabitha had accidentally hung up. All I can say is you have a long journey ahead of you, Cat. Events that take place now will shape what the future holds for you. But it'll be a bright future, I promise. 
Though obtuse, I appreciated the reassurance. A future in the clink after Inquisitors caught up with me couldn't possibly be interpreted as bright, so I figured I'd have to prevail. Thanks, Aunt Tabby. You're a lifesaver. I'll call and let- A beeping sounded in my ear, and I bit back a curse. Someone was on the other line. You'd better get that. I'd say it's important. I noted the amused tone to her voice, but just as I was about to ask why, the call ended and the phone rang in my ear. Answering with a more clipped greeting than usual, I waited for the unknown caller to state their business and flinched at the sound of Detective Swan's smooth voice. Cat, Detective Swan, I need you to come in and make a statement. I think it would be a good idea to bring your boyfriend with you. My boyfriend? A lump formed in my throat, and I wondered how the heck the detective had learned about my love life so quickly, and how that boded for Damon's connection to Bobby. Well, uh, sure. When were you thinking? As soon as possible. What are you doing tonight after work? I gave Swan assurances and ended the call. Damon was going to freak out when I told him the detective had asked for him specifically. I clutched the phone to my chest. At least he had a solid alibi with the lawyers for the night of the murder. Chapter 5 Damon fiddled with his keys in the grimy waiting area of the police station while I flipped absently through a magazine left behind by some other poor soul who'd gone before me. Fluorescent lights flickered overhead and I swallowed to keep the acidic taste in my mouth down. I'm not waiting much longer, Damon huffed. Why they had to drag us all the way out here is beyond me. It's close to the store. I folded the magazine in my lap and looked around at the few people loitering. It wasn't the kind of affluence Damon was used to, and to be honest, the big guy with tattoos in the corner was a bit creepy. What did they say on the phone again? It's just a statement, Damon. I told them about my movements that night. They want to get it on record. If they need it, I'm sure they can get footage of the building that proves I wasn't at the store when it happened. I don't think it's you they're worried about. He rubbed the bridge of his nose and I patted his leg. You'll be fine. Nothing to hide, huh? He only raised his eyebrows and nodded before plucking the magazine from my lap. Mr. Carrington, cat? Detective Swan flashed a smile at me from the doorway and Damon looked the man up and down. I bounced up off the seat quicker than was strictly necessary and felt my cheeks color. Detective! He took us down a drab hallway lined with dark green linoleum and opened a door on the right that led to a small interview room, complete with a mirrored window. Detective Cruz sat scowling, and I flashed her a nervous smile as we sat. So, Swan closed the door and joined his partner across from us. I'm glad you two could come in on short notice. We confirmed the ID of the victim we found murdered in your place of business today, Robert Bobby Maynard. I believe you were familiar with him, Mr. Carrington. I supposed it wouldn't have been that hard to figure out. Despite efforts to suppress the case, there had been a few gossipy articles published about the lawsuit, ones that didn't shine a particularly good light on the Carrington family. It's no secret Bobby was taking my father's firm to court. Damon sat back in his seat and crossed his legs. It's still unfortunate the man ended up dead. I wondered why they were asking all this in front of me and where the camera that was supposed to be recording was. Didn't they usually speak to people one-on-one? -on -one? Weren't you supposed to give your name for the record and all that stuff on TV? Cat, you said you weren't sure if you knew the victim on the night of the murder. Swan turned his eyes to me. Did you recall afterward that your boyfriend here ripped the man off? What? I gasped. No, I mean, yes, I only ever met the man once. And when you said Robert, I thought the name sounded familiar, but it was only after telling Damon that I realized it was Bobby. My heart thudded in my chest, and my mind swam with the accusations. Ripped off? It was a dispute in front of the court. Nobody was guilty yet, and even if there was a settlement, that didn't mean Damon ripped Bobby off. But as I went to open my mouth, Detective Cruz cut in. Must be very convenient to have that case disappear overnight. We'll get your official statements in a bit, but what we really want to know was if you two were in cahoots. I wasn't a person with a short temper. 
but Cruz's attitude had rubbed me the wrong way since we'd met. Damon opened his mouth to speak, but I clamped a hand down on his knee and flashed my teeth at the detective. Excuse me, cahoots, are you implying we had anything to do with Bobby's murder? Cruz just shrugged. If the shoe fits, he did happen to have a note in his pocket with the address of your store. Sloppy on the part of the murderer, wouldn't you say? I stood, the chair behind me scraping back. Damon held onto my arm, and both detectives reached for their sidearms. You have my movements on the night of the murder, and I'm sure by now you've verified them. Damon was with the lawyers. Ah, ah, Damon waved his hand and tugged me by the arm to sit. I was with my father the whole night, talking about the case for sure. Cat just gets a little confused sometimes. I blinked, then glared at Damon. But my skin tingled, and I looked to the detectives, who had a slightly glazed look to their eyes. Doing magic on people was way worse than letting a magical plant get into public circulation, and I gripped the chair so hard my palms hurt. Come on, detectives. Damon's voice was super smooth. Why would I murder a man in my girlfriend's store? The alarm went off, didn't it? Don't you think I would have turned it off? It doesn't make any sense. Damon didn't know the code for the alarm system. In fact, I was pretty sure he hadn't been to the store since I signed the lease. The detectives nodded, and Damon turned on a Cheshire Cat smile. Good. Now I was with my father all night. He'll corroborate. Here's his number. Damon flicked a business card from his wallet across the table and took my hand. Thanks for meeting with us, detectives. My palm was clammy, but Damon didn't even look at me as Swan and Cruz thanked us for coming in. I swallowed bile as my boyfriend led me out of the precinct, too terrified to say anything. Was a murderer holding my hand? Why the heck would he lie to the police? Or was it me he was lying to? When he opened the passenger door to his bright yellow sports car, I couldn't bring myself to get in. We'll talk at home, Cat. I shook my head and swallowed. I don't think so. He took me by the shoulders and looked me in the eye. I know what you're thinking, but it's not true. Now let's get in the car before the entire police force sees us arguing. I looked up at the looming building and shivered despite the warm air. They'd thought I was part of it. Whatever Damon was playing at, it was in my interest to go along, at least for the time being. I slid into the passenger seat and strapped on my seatbelt woodenly. We drove back to the apartment in silence, and I was thankful for the time to puzzle over the events. Glamour ran strong in Damon's family, and there were those in magical circles who whispered about the family using their powers for nefarious means. But I couldn't possibly believe the man I was in love with could do something so awful, over money, no less. When we pulled into our space in the underground garage, I didn't even wait for Damon to cut the engine before springing out the car and up the steps that led to our apartment. The air felt too close, too unclean. What if he wanted to work his magic on me, too? What if he already had? I paced the rooftop terrace with my hands on my hips. It was ten feet across, and the absence of the smell of grass made my makeshift garden feel fake. The whole damn apartment did. Damon did. I tried to imagine the scent of the mountains to calm my nerves and jumped out of my skin when Damon placed his hands on my shoulders from behind to turn me into his embrace. That was frightening, I know. He smoothed my hair. But you were about to get me in a lot of trouble. Just not the kind you're thinking. I stepped backward and looked into his eyes. Then who were you lying to, Damon? Them or me? Them, he conceded. I was with the lawyers that night, just not ours. What? I frowned. What's that supposed to mean? Damon licked his lips and stared off into the distance. It was Bobby's lawyer. For a large sum of money, they agreed to give us information. Money? My mouth twisted. Or did you do your thing with them? Cat, he shook his head. I'd never well look. Do you want me to go to prison? If they found out I'd bribed a lawyer, it would be more than me. The entire family would suffer. You weren't even with your dad, were you? I shook my head. You just know he'd have your back. Grandma was right. You Carringtons are all the same. I left Damon standing on the terrace and closed the door firmly to our bedroom. He could sleep on the couch. After that, 
Well, I had things to figure out. I kicked off my boots to flop onto the bed, the duck egg blue covers matching the shade of the walls exactly. When I'd first seen the place, I'd loved its sleek style, but it felt a lot less like home as time went on. More like a dollhouse I was allowed to play in, even if I looked completely out of place in jeans and gumboots. Damon didn't try his luck with the door, but that didn't mean I was getting any sleep either. Gus nudged my cheek buried into the pillow and I sniffed as I rolled onto my side. What's all this about? Gus put his paw on my cheek. And where have you been? I'm starving. Starving, I choked. My life is falling apart right now and all you can think about is food? Well, you chose to keep company with Carrington's. If you weren't as hard-headed as your grandma, you never would have taken up with him. The relationship itself had been a sore point with grandma. Our families had traded insults over the council table for centuries. When we got together, it had felt like a Romeo and Juliet story. Except star-crossed wasn't really a problem in this day and age, and grandma had finally conceded that. Kat's gonna do what she wants, even if it is stupid. Oh, sure, this is all my fault. I took a shuddery breath. Just because you're having a hard time in California? I'm doing just fine, thank you very much. It's you I'm worried about. You've either got your head in the sand most days, or so swept up in the business you can't see what is as plain as day in front of you. Gus sat back on his haunches and glared. Or maybe I was happy. Did you ever think of that? Humans, Gus groaned. I blame it on your kind sense of smell. The stench of lies surrounding that man is rancid, and yet you want to believe him every time. Fine, I pushed up off the bed and scowled. You're hungry? You can go eat your chow and sleep on the sofa with Damon tonight. Your breath doesn't exactly smell like a bunch of roses after dinner either, pal. When I stormed into the kitchen, I let go of a breath as I realized Damon must have stayed on the terrace to cool his head. I dumped Gus's dinner unceremoniously into his bowl and shooed him from the doorway as I retreated to my sanctuary. My mind turned with possibilities. It was long past time to call the Inquisitors and have them take up the case. I wanted to believe Damon. We'd all made mistakes, and I was certainly no angel, but everything felt like it was getting too deep. The new information about the note in Bobby's pocket took away whatever hope I had about my store being an unfortunate bystander in all of this. I could comb through every receipt I ever wrote, but I was certain the man had never been there before the night of the murder, and certainly not after closing. There was a connection I was missing. If I wasn't sold on the idea of the nephew, Steve, being the culprit, and wanted to believe Damon didn't have a hand in it, who was left? Randall Lockhart? It seemed unlikely, but maybe there was something I didn't know about the guy. He didn't ask too many questions about my plant collection, but he treated his own orchids like children. Had he been eyeing my lily in secret? Wouldn't he have just asked if he could buy it? I rubbed my eyes, wondering when exactly I'd become such a Nancy Drew, but could think of no other way to rectify the situation. Life couldn't go on as normal until this case was solved and firmly in my rearview mirror. If I wanted to know more about Randall's relationship with Bobby, then the best place to do some snooping was the orchid show. I'd been invited, after all. Chapter 6 When I had found Damon gone in the morning, all I'd felt was relief. Rather than dwell at home listening to Gus try to convince me of the worst, I decided to head into the store early to get some proper thinking time. After leaving my familiar with a bowl full to the brim with treats, feeling just a touch guilty at snapping at him the night before, I hopped in my van and picked up a coffee on the way. Coffee was good for thinking, or at least it soothed the soul. If there was a magical solution to almost every problem, my brand of magic left a lot to be desired. My affinity to living things, with a penchant for plant, life, didn't exactly give me the kind of mojo Damon had in getting what he wanted with people. But thinking of Damon was a good place to start. Adjusting the water and nutrient levels in my setup was part of my morning ritual, and I took particular notice of the shelf where my fire lily had been. Other than some disturbed dust, there wasn't any sign of who might have taken the pot. Damon was allergic to lilies. 
If he'd been at the store on the night of the murder, surely he would have had some kind of reaction when he disposed of the plant. But I hadn't seen him until the morning, and in that time, a few hay fever pills could have taken care of any symptoms. And what was up with him doing the laundry anyhow? Was there anything incriminating on his clothes he had to deal with? Being so suspicious of the man who shared my life stung to the very core of my being, and I chewed my lip as I turned to Pete. The energy coming off him in waves seemed irritable, though he could have been picking up on my state of mind. His traps twitched as I stared, and I wondered if his overfill on the night of the murder was kicking off a spurt of growth that may be difficult to manage down the line. He'd stood no higher than my knees when I brought him out to California, and already he was close to my height. In my haste to build my own little oasis, I'd probably spurred on the growth imprudently. But then my thoughts wandered to what else I could imbue in this impressive specimen. My phone rang. I groaned when I saw the caller ID. Hey, Mom. My voice was probably a little too cheery, and I winced. Katerina, nice of you to answer your phone. I drew a deep breath and recalled the message from last week. Sorry, Mom, it's kind of been a big week. Oh? Too big to call your mother back, huh? I guess I deserved that. I'd already decided on how I would handle the situation with my family if asked, so I kept to my story. Had a break-in at the store. Been cleaning up the mess and dealing with insurance. It wasn't a lie, but I knew if I started talking about murders, she'd have a conniption. Son of a... Really, cat? I knew something like this would happen. Darn cities and their disregard for decency. You really oughta... It's fine, Mom. I've got it under control. Really. I took a deep breath, willing myself to keep calm. Well, did they steal much? It's those drug dealers, isn't it? I rubbed my forehead and ran my tongue over my teeth. No, not drug dealers. The place was a mess. Probably kids who were just bent on wrecking the place. Okay, that was a white lie. But if I didn't assuage her speculations, I'd have both her and Grandma on the door demanding answers. Well, you let me know if there's anything I can do to help. How's Damon? My heart leaped into my throat at the mere mention of his name. He's fine, I cringed. The words sounded like a squeak. How's the surgery going? There was a pause on the line, but thankfully she took the hint. Oh, the usual, you know. Got a possum on the mend out in the barn, and last week I had to stitch old Harry up. The man is a walking accident, let me tell you. Grandma's been doing the rounds with folks around these parts, leading into the election, and... While the sound of Mom's voice was comforting, I wasn't in a state of mind to keep up on the running commentary of small-town life. I rubbed my temple, and though guilt gnawed at my belly, I cut her off. Listen, Mom, can I call you back? I bit my lip. I've got to get back to the insurance agent. Sure. She sounded a little suspect. But first... Is there anything I can do to help? The question bounced around my mind for a few seconds, then the dilemma coalesced into purpose. Mom, do you know any way to cast some kind of recognition spell? Like, if I charmed a plant that was in the shop that night, it could let me know somehow if the culprit came back in? There was a pause on the line, and I tapped my fingers on the counter. Remembering spells are easy enough on people, and I'd figure the same would be true for animals. Not that I've had cause to use one, but plants, unless they had minds of their own before the spell. You wouldn't have done something like that, would you, honey? In public? And that was the crux of the situation. But without her help, I wouldn't get much further, so I took a measured breath and confessed. Maybe just a few. But I promise I was careful. I'll take them back to the apartment, but all I want to know is if it was one of my regulars that broke in. The tutting on the other end of the line shamed me right down to my boots, but I knew I deserved at least a reprimand. It ain't like home in the city, cat. I told you keeping magic under wraps was harder in such an overcrowded cesspit of people. If you get found out and have inquisitors sniffing around, you'll put your grandma in an early grave. I know. I chose my words carefully. And I promise I've learned my lesson. All I want to know is who broke into the shop. After that, there won't be a whiff of magic at the store. Mom sighed, and I knew I had her.
Should really be letting the law handle it, Cat. But I'll help you out this once. You find out which lowlife did it and make sure you pass on the details. Grandma will hex them with all she's got. Of that, I had no doubt. But I knew I wouldn't be passing on that kind of information. Mom gave me a list of incantations to try with suggestions for modifications. It didn't sound all that promising, rather slapdash in nature, but it was the closest I was going to get without arousing arcane suspicion, so I thanked her with all the gratitude I could muster, with a promise to call her back on the weekend. When I ended the call, I flipped the closed sign and locked the door. Putting a spell on Pete could come with all kinds of unintended consequences given the nature of his creation, but I was feeling desperate. If he could recognize the killer, I'd know which way to point the finger and recover my fire lily. I'd probably scared off the stoners after our last conversation about the detectives, but Randall would be at the orchid show tomorrow, and I could always drag Damon out to the shop on some pretense. My hands shook, and I sat cross-legged by Pete's pot to calm my nerves. I closed my eyes to clear my mind, seeking that place of focus which yielded the best magical results. I had it almost within reach, tantalizingly close. Then the phone rang, and I growled with irritation. The caller ID was blocked, and I hoped it might have been word on a police report for the insurance. Hello? Cat. Detective Swan again. I doubted Swan did the reports for insurance. Detective, what can I do for you? I, uh, well... First off, thanks for coming in last night. I don't know how we missed it, but we forgot to get your official statement. He sounded chagrined, which was refreshing after his attitude from the night before. Huh, I suppose we did. My apologies, a clumsy mistake. I don't want to take up too much of your time. So whenever you have a chance this week, I'd be grateful if you'd come in. Any of the officers can take the statement. Just an account of your movements for the night of the murder. The change in his demeanor was distracting, and my skin crawled, thinking about Damon's magic still lingering in the man's mind. I swallowed and assured him I'd make time to come in, then took a chance on a question to see whether I could glean any useful information. So, are you any closer to finding the killer? I bit my lip and screwed my eyes shut. I, uh, he paused. We're still pursuing several lines of inquiry. It could take a while before we make arrests. I supposed that was at least more information than I could expect to get in an ongoing murder investigation. Reading between the lines, it sounded as though the detectives were stumped. It didn't bode well for my insurance claim, but at least I still had the opportunity to get in ahead of law enforcement to clean up my singing flower mess. Okay then, I guess I'll hear from you when the case is cracked. Yeah. The phone line muffled as though he was switching ears. In case something comes up, I'll give you my cell. I scrawled down the phone number, then repeated it back to him, and after ending the call, I wondered if detectives legitimately gave out their cell phone numbers to civilians. Perhaps I was reading too much into it, but he was easy on the eye. And it was inappropriate of me to be speculating on that kind of thing. Rather than get bogged down on the spiral of shame that came with admiring a man's fair features while committed to another, I saved the number in my phone just in case and turned it off before sitting back down in front of Pete. One of his traps twisted on its stalk to reach for me, and I patted the head with a twinge of pride in my belly. Even if I could find a witch or wizard buyer for Pete, I wasn't sure if I'd willingly give him up. Maybe the whimsical thought came from the risk of doing permanent damage while firing spells at him willy-nilly. But finding my way in a big city with a new business had been that much more bearable as I marked his growth milestones. I drew a deep breath through my nose and kept my fingers on Pete's green, fleshy trap. My connection to him hummed in the surrounding air, latent magic which only I could perceive, and I whispered the words I hoped were closest to my purpose. My skin tingled, and Pete's flesh vibrated under my fingertips. When everything snapped into place, Pete recoiled with a hiss. Ah, oh, Pete! I scrambled up onto my feet and reached to placate him. His stalks writhed, and he pressed his traps against the wall as far away from me as he could. The shock was understandable, but I had to know if the spell had worked. You can hear me now, right? All five traps nodded, and I blinked in surprise. And if you saw who murdered that man, you'd let me know? 
Again, the traps nodded, and I wondered if there were a simpler solution to the problem. Did Steve Maynard kill that man, the stoner guy? The traps didn't move, and I repeated the same for Randall and Damon, both to the same effect. My best guess was that Pete had never taken note of names prior to his cognizant awakening, but was aware enough to ID the killer on sight. It was getting close to closing time on a Friday, and the next opportunity to see Randall was the Orchid Show. I hoped a ride in the van wouldn't be too rough on Pete, but I couldn't bear to pass an entire weekend with Damon without learning the truth. Chapter 7 I was just slipping into a fresh pair of black, skinny jeans and grabbing my purse when Damon walked through the door, his eyes red-rimmed, and he still wore the same suit from the night before. I hadn't bothered to call or text him when I realized he wasn't home and looked him up and down as he raked his fingers through his hair. I can explain, he ventured. Nope, I shook my head. No, you cannot. I don't know what's going on with you, but this kind of nonsense won't wash with me. He stepped forward and took my hand. I snatched it back. I've been a wreck, Cat. After the other night with that glamour I put on the detectives, making you go through that has been eating me up inside. I considered walking out the door and leaving him to stew, but decided that enough was enough. Things between us were coming to a head, and it had to be resolved. Fine. I sat on the edge of the sofa and folded my arms with a warning look to Gus to butt out of the argument. You think you can explain? Now's your chance, but hurry. I have an orchid show to get to. He glanced a little wistfully at the coffee machine, but I tapped my foot on the floorboards to make it clear I wouldn't sit around waiting. Swallowing, he dropped to the other sofa with a sigh and cradled his head in his hands. Everyone thinks us Carringtons are bad news, and maybe they're right. We didn't get to where we are now at the firm without twisting a few arms. He leaned back on the sofa and met my gaze. Dad expects us to go out there and win, and when Bobby brought the lawsuit, he was furious. That much I could believe. The man made my skin crawl sometimes. I just panicked, you know? We didn't rip the man off, but the project didn't go as planned. But that didn't matter. He had enough money to sink us with legal costs, I didn't want to use magic, he said, biting his lip. Well, not entirely anyway. The lawyer took the bribe with a little persuasion, and I thought nobody would ever have to know. I shook my head, gutted that Damon could think that was a fair enough excuse. But when I opened my mouth to speak, he rushed onward. It was wrong. If I'd have known what was going to happen, he took a shuddery breath. It was you I let down, Cat. I'd gladly take the rap for anything to protect you. When we were in with the detectives, all I could think about is how you were caught up in this. There was no way I would let them drag your name through the mud. This isn't like you, I frowned, ghosting me for days, off on shady deals. Where were you last night? His eyes lowered and he rubbed his hands together. I got drunk. By the time I got back here, I was too ashamed to come upstairs. I slept in my car. The notion of Damon's six-foot frame curled up in his teeny, tiny sports car was a little ludicrous, but when he looked up at me, I saw the embarrassment in his features. I wasn't sure if I was prepared to forgive him his transgressions, but I didn't want to shoot him down, either. He'd landed himself in hot water, same as me. Maybe a little hotter, but I couldn't put myself on a pedestal when I'd flouted magical law, too. Well, I don't know what to say. I sighed. Maybe after they catch the killer, we can put this all behind us. But in the meantime, you think I did it? Damon's face twisted. You think I killed Bobby? Maybe I took too long in answering, but I couldn't completely discount the idea, even with his tortured expression as the seconds dragged on. Did you? No. He flew off his seat and drew ragged breaths. How could you even think that, Cat? You know me. I'd never hurt anyone. Yeah, trust the guy without a familiar. He's really caring, Gus said. I glared at my meddlesome feline who poked his head out from behind the bedroom door. I don't know what to think, and if you'll excuse me, I've got a show to get to. I stormed out to protests from both Gus and Damon, but I slammed the door anyhow. 
Close to tears, I hustled downstairs to my van and fired her up before screeching off onto the street. Damon had looked truly down in the dumps, and it was killing me to think he could be capable of murder, but I knew I couldn't rule him out. His alibi for the night was unreliable. He'd been acting all weird, and Bobby posed a threat to his business interests. Sure, Steve Maynard had done well out of his uncle's death, but why on earth would he lure his estranged uncle to my store of all places to do away with him? Did he think being there earlier that day gave him a plausible reason to have his fingerprints hanging around? That seemed pretty well considered on his part in a roundabout way, and I pushed away a mental image of my precious fire lily singing on some coffee table next to a bong. With no address to look Steve up, though, I had to cross Randall off the list first. The reconnaissance mission to the Orchid Show was an opportunity to do more than bump into Randall. Folks in those circles could have information about Bobby which could be of use. I pulled up at the store, still furiously calculating, and dragged Pete out on a hand truck with half a mind for his snapping traps. After securing him in the back, I gave him some steak for the road and headed out onto the highway. I had a good drive ahead of me, and I hoped that after pulling the hoses from Pete's pot, he wouldn't start wilting in the metal box that was my vehicle. I had no coupons to give out, and only a handful of business cards littered on the floor of the passenger seat. But I was determined to insert myself into the show and find out who the heck was responsible for Bobby Maynard's death. When I pulled into the convention center, I was a little overwhelmed by the sheer number of cars in the lot. How many people honestly turned up to those kinds of things? I got a parking space in the back and groaned internally at the thought of lugging Pete all the way to the doors in the blistering sun. I got some strange looks as I wrangled the flytrap, whose irritation at being displaced was borne out in writhing and hissing, but nobody stopped me at the front door. Instead, the people issuing tickets stood with their mouths hanging open as I swiped my card and whispered platitudes in hushed tones as I bumped Pete through the second set of doors with an overly wide grin. A swarm of people strolled leisurely between long aisles of orchid displays, and some looked up with interest as I made my appearance. Swallowing my nerves, I parked Pete on the end of one such aisle and caught my breath. Is that a flytrap? A man leaned in a little close and squinted. I inserted myself between him and Pete and produced a card for the store with a smile. Sure is. Grown in one of my very own systems. You should come by sometime and check out the store. The man curled his lip at the card and kept walking. If there was one thing I knew, it was that a hard sell turned most folks away. And business aside, I wasn't really here to chat to random people. After smiling and nodding to gawkers and trading a few words and cards here and there, I was wondering where Randall could be when a woman with a crisp white perm and oversized handbag approached. Well, would you look at that, that there is stunning, though I can't imagine too many folks appreciating a good old-fashioned fly trap. Her southern accent was warming, and I turned to Pete with a grin. He may not be as pretty as an orchid, but I still think he's impressive. Course, dear. She looked me up and down with shrewd appraisal. I'm June, from Louisiana. You sound like you're not from round these parts, neither. I nodded and we did the usual thing of trading locations and their proximity to larger towns as we took each other's measure. Huh, and what's a young girl like you doing in California with us oldies at an orchid show? I run Happy Harvest Hydroponics. Thought I'd come by and let everybody know about the store. My best customers are orchid enthusiasts. I'll bet. I reckon your other customers would be the skeezy types. I held back a sigh. The whole catering to drug dealers bit was starting to wear thin. Now, yours wouldn't be the store that Bobby ended up dead in, would it? June leaned in a little closer and glanced around at people milling by. Bingo, I thought. I knew June's type, and if she'd heard about Bobby, then I was sure she had already formed an opinion on the matter. Yes, rest his soul. It was really rather tragic. Did he usually shop there? June dropped her voice to a conspiratorial whisper. Nope, I shook my head. Never been in the store before that night. I heard he was strangled with a hose. June made a face. Wretched way to go if you ask me. That June from the Orchid Show knew the cause of death when I didn't was remarkable. 
though if the topic had come up over a game of bridge somewhere, I supposed it wasn't that unbelievable. I couldn't say. I shrugged. Say, have you seen Randall Lockhart anywhere today? Her eyes widened, then twinkled, and she gripped my arm. Not a whiff of the man. Quite conspicuous, if you ask me. Conspicuous? I cocked my head. Well, June gave me one of those severe stares that usually came just before a torrent of third-hand gossip. It's no secret those two hated each other. After Charlene passed, it only seemed to get worse. Hated? That was news. Who's Charlene? Why, Bobby's late wife. Poor woman died of breast cancer a few years back. June gave one of those looks that seemed almost abashed for spilling the dirt. Except it was Randall she married first, you see? I hear Charlene and Bobby were having an affair for years before she broke it off with Randall. I didn't know whether to be horrified or relieved. The revelation drew a picture in my mind where Randall's motive to murder Bobby made a lot of sense. But for Randall to come by a day later and lie to me about being friends with Bobby, it unnerved me almost as much as Damon's lies about the lawyers. My mouth was dry, and I swallowed before mumbling some kind of exclamation to June. Her shrewd eyes took in my shock, and I knew I only had a matter of hours before every biddy in the convention center had learned of our conversation. If the senior citizen's grapevine was anything to go by, Randall would hear all about it by the time I opened the shop on Monday morning. I was going to have to hustle if I wanted to capitalize on the element of surprise. And there was only one way to prove if Randall was the murderer. Chapter 8 As one of my best customers, I had Randall's address and didn't need to go back to the store to recall it. I wasn't sure if the street number was 252 or 525, but I was sure I'd recognize the house on site after delivering big orders on several occasions. Pete looked well enough to make the trip, if a little droopy, and I'd topped up his water before sliding him in the back of the van. I'd been inside Randall's place, too, and into the manicured greenhouse that held his most precious possessions. Of course, I hadn't snooped around in there, but I'd also never thought there was anything unusual about his orchids. The man loved flowers. Was the theft of my fire lily explanation enough on that front? Or did he have a magical secret that he'd been withholding? The possibilities raced around my mind as I drove along the highway against the sun's glare. In the time I'd known Randall, I'd never considered his love life. Maybe I supposed he was at an age where he was past all that, but even in my own mind, that sounded naive. Was I just hoping that Randall was the murderer so I didn't have to confront Damon? When I pulled up on his street, I parked a little ways down from his house. It was a pleasant neighborhood, and my palms were clammy on the steering wheel as I worried that the van stuck out like a sore thumb. Each home seemed to loom over the street. Their manicured gardens almost seemed to leer at me. I swallowed to slow my hammering heart, convinced that someone would spring out from behind a bush pointing a finger any second. I mean, it wasn't like me to go breaking into people's houses. Was that what I was doing? Perhaps it would be easier to just knock on the door and pretend I was visiting. But I wouldn't have said Randall and I were on popping by terms. And if he was the killer, turning up out of the blue would get his hackles up. I racked my brain to think of a magical solution. I hadn't even brought my grimoire to the city when I moved. Both mom and grandma had me scared stiff that inquisitors lurked behind every corner, and it's not like I usually dealt in magic outside of my repertoire. But magic was about intent and need most times, and I couldn't think of a time I needed anything more. I was summoning the courage to get out of the van when I saw the garage door at Randall's roll upwards. Scooting down in my seat to avoid notice, I peered over the dash as his white suburban rolled onto the street, thankfully pointed in the other direction. I'd never been so happy that I couldn't afford fancy graphics on the side of the van announcing my shop's name. Randall's departure meant the coast was clear. The man lived alone. Worried that he might only be running down to the store, I took a calming breath and reached for my phone. Cat, Randell answered, his voice muffled by the hands free. Is everything okay? Sure. I held my stomach to keep the butterflies in check. 
I was going to ask you the same thing. I didn't see you down at the orchid show today. Ah, uh, made it down there, did you? He cleared his throat. Was feeling a bit under the weather myself. About to head to the doctor's office, in fact. Oh, I wondered which ritzy doctor opened their door on a weekend. Well, you take care. I'll see you soon. How'd it go? Randall asked. At the show. It was great. I giggled and cringed. Ended up taking Pete anyhow. He was quite the attraction. I'm sure he was. I didn't know what to say next, but Randall spared me the trouble. I'll see you next week, hey? I have some plans to expand one of my systems. Sure, I said. That'd be great. After ending the call, I tapped my mouth with my finger, trying to determine if Randall was feeding me a line. He didn't sound unwell, and though that didn't say much, seeing a doctor over the weekend suggested a level of urgency. But then, what reason would he have to lie? It could be as simple as a lame excuse for skipping the show, but Randall loved that kind of thing. Sitting in the car, conjecturing wasn't going to answer any questions, though, so I steeled my nerves and jumped out of the van, then opened the back to grab some pots. A delivery girl wouldn't arouse any suspicion from nosy neighbors, I figured. If Randall chewed their ears off half as much as mine, no eyebrows should be raised at a delivery of garden supplies. Pete swung a trap at the intrusion, and I left the door open a crack to let in some air. The trek up the street into Randall's yard was the longest in my life. Hundreds of stray thoughts crossed my mind. Why would a delivery chick park up the road? Was I walking too fast, too slow? What would I even say if Randall pulled up and caught me lurking? Glamour or no, Detective Swan would think I was a weirdo if he heard I was breaking and entering. But the heavens above didn't bust open and shine a spotlight on my prowling self. The only witness to my approach was a fluffy white cat sitting on top of a fence. A feline stink eye wasn't enough to rattle my cage, so I slipped down the driveway and passed the entrance to the side gate, which was unlocked, as luck would have it. I lifted the latch to let myself into Randall's yard, my nerves quieting some knowing I had an obstacle-free escape route. The large greenhouse sat next to an enclosed patio coming off the back of the white brick home. The gardens were immaculate, and anyone would think it was Randall's pride and joy. But I knew better. Blue chalk sticks and guara made for low-maintenance embellishments. It was inside the white-framed greenhouse that the real gardening happened and the glass door was most certainly locked. I sighed and rubbed at the sweat beating on my brow. This was the part where I produced a set of lockpicks and snapped the tumblers open with practiced ease, right? Or at least had some magic words handy that would bust the door right in. But I hadn't spent my spare moments as a teen researching how to become a delinquent, which would have come in handy right about then. Rather than think about all the things I should have done before heading to Randall's, I slipped between a glass wall and butterfly bush, seeking another way in. Keeping the temperature and ventilation consistent inside a greenhouse was crucial. And on a day as warm as that one was, there had to be some stray windows open under the shade cloth that had been slung over the frame. Biting back curses as my shirt snagged, I wriggled my way around the structure until I found what I was looking for. A window pushed outward on its hinge, though only just a crack. It was going to be an almighty squeeze, but I couldn't see everything from outside. Glad at least I was in tight jeans, I tucked in my button-up shirt and summoned skinny thoughts as I ducked in under the window. Skinny thoughts or no, I didn't think I was going to make it past my hips and heard the popping sound of a shirt button as it tore free. The muggy air inside was stifling, and the sweat on my brow migrated all the way down between my shoulder blades. With one last shimmy, I got my butt through the frame and lowered myself through, mindful not to upset the plant stands. My ankle was last, and I winced as the aluminum frame scraped it. If anyone was watching, they were probably having a good laugh. It was a far cry from turning cartwheels down a laser-protected hallway, but I was in. That was what counted. The glass walls drowned out birds chirping and cars passing by on the street. In their place were the familiar hums and drips of a hydroponic system delivering optimal water flow to each pot. I rubbed my ankle and stood, then cast my eye around the rows of orchids in every hue and variety. 
They really were rather breathtaking, though for a minute I felt a twinge of something close to regret. Beautiful plants should be admired, and so many of them in a private collection seemed like such a waste, like each bloom was competing for the attention. Blinking, I turned on my heel and wondered where to start. The back of the greenhouse contained stacked pots and supplies, so I headed in that direction, figuring a person trying to hide something wouldn't put it front and center. The humid air was stifling, and I scanned each stand as I passed. Orchids in various stages of growth, from cuttings, recently divided clumps, and even germinating seeds were neatly organized in rows. And though the greenhouse was larger than most backyard setups, Randall had already begun assembling vertical stands to fit more in. I'd need to hustle if I wanted to comb every inch of the place in under ten minutes. Just as I was squatting to peer past a Mokara orchid's broad leaves, a loud thump from above brought an unbidden screech from my throat. Landing on my butt, I looked upward, then glared at a raven trotting over the glass panes with dreadful scratching noises. Great, I thought. I'd get a primetime spot on a world's dumbest criminals show by alerting the neighbors to my presence, all on account of a bird. The raven sprang into the air, and I took calming breaths to regain my composure. This whole nonsense was really starting to tick me off, and my fright fizzled into indignation. Why the heck did a dead body have to turn up at my store? What kind of crazy world of coincidence was I living when my boyfriend of all people was a suspect in the murder along with two of my customers? All I wanted to do was to live a quiet life and grow a couple of enchanted plants. Was that too much to ask? Maybe the universe was trying to tell me something about my decision to move to California altogether. That or my grandma. But I doubted she would go to that length with hexing magic to make a point. I hoped. Since I was already on the floor, I rolled onto my knees and crawled along to keep the bottom shelves at eye level while I searched. There was simply nothing other than orchids in the whole darn greenhouse. While I appreciated that Randall's passion leaned in one direction horticulturally, it was bizarre there wasn't even one other form of plant life within view. Doubt writhed in my belly. Perhaps I was barking up the wrong tree after all. What kind of motive could a man obsessed with orchids have with my fire lily? But then I saw something which changed my mind. Scrambling to my feet, I touched the shimmering velvet soft petal of Alalia and felt the thrum of magical energy pulse into my fingertip. When I sent a thread of magic the other way, the petals twisted and a caterwauling pierced my brain. I recoiled, breaking the connection, and took a step back. Beside the now silent Lelia orchid, a shriveled brown mess sat starkly obvious among the verdant green. It was like an old toaster torn to bits to understand the inner workings. I reached to touch what I knew was the remains of my fire lily, then the sound of a door closing from the direction of the garage had me dropping to the floor and rolling under the nearest shelf. Even through the buzzing and trickling sounds of the hydroponic system, the metallic snap of keys turning the lock of the greenhouse door was crystal clear. My heart pounded in my chest as the scuffling of feet on the gravel indicated that someone had entered the greenhouse. The sound of the door closing had echoed like a portent of doom. I thought nothing worse could happen at that moment. Then my phone beeped with a text message, and I knew all hope of getting out undiscovered had vanished. Chapter 9 People do strange things when faced with imminent danger. Despite being a person who mutters at the TV screen for people to run in horror flicks when they freeze in terror, I did something just about as counterintuitive to self-preservation. I plucked my phone out of my pocket, incredulous that someone could be so inconsiderate as to send me a text at such an inconvenient time, and glared at the screen. It was from Damon and made absolutely no sense at first glance. I'm going to end it with her. I just need time to get out of this police situation. I love you. I almost forgot that I was hiding under a shelf in a customer's greenhouse, a customer who happened to have murdered someone in my store. I juggled the phone with numb fingers, trying to scroll to get some context. Cat? Randall's voice was smooth and dripped with dark amusement. I know you're in here. 
You didn't think I would have taken precautions for my collection? Picked you up on the camera hidden in the patio. I swallowed bile and my muscles tensed as the crunching footfalls drew nearer. This was it. I was going to die in a glass box at the hand of a psychopath. Flexing my fingers in an effort to bring them back under control, I searched for the number that was my only hope of salvation. After hitting the call button, I curled my arm up around the shelf and stashed the phone in between a couple of pots. My only prayer to the universe was that he'd answer. It was you, Randall? I rolled out from under the shelf and clambered to my feet. You killed Bobby Maynard. Randall wore a wide grin and shook his head as he looked me up and down. Clever girl. Always thought you were too smart by half to be with a Carrington. But then love is blinding. I blinked, utterly confused. I never meant you any harm, Cat. I like to think of us as friends, but I had a debt to settle with Arthur Carrington. Sending his boy off to prison for murder was too good an opportunity to pass up. And Bobby Maynard? Well, that was just icing on the cake. I glanced between the botched musical orchid and Randall. You're a warlock? I clicked my teeth shut and covered my mouth. I'm not a very active part of the community these days, he drawled. Not after Arthur stitched me up, but I still know a trick or two. He clicked his fingers, and a burst of flame hovered above his palm. I flinched, and he took a step toward me. This isn't about Shirlene? I took a step back. Shirlene? Randall's features darkened, then something sparked in his eyes. The Orchid Show, eh? My late wife used to work for Arthur. In fact, that's how we met. You won't get away with this, Randall. This is insane. Perhaps. He rolled his fingers and the flames swayed. Taking the lily was rather sloppy on my part. But I suspect you didn't report it as missing with the authorities, H.M. My facial expression must have confirmed his assumption. And as I backed away, he laughed. It was taxing, you know, coming by all the time and studiously ignoring your blatant disregard for magical law. He stopped by the orchid and ran a finger up the stem. Magical talent is a fickle thing. Rarely does one find keen interest within their capacity. Rather unfair, don't you think? Imagine what I could do with your natural skills. I chose to ignore his conjecturing, but wanted to draw out the conversation as long as I could. As I took another step back, a stack of pots tumbled over, and I winced. How long have you known about Damon? How long did you have this planned? My butt hit the furthest bench against the wall. And how the heck did you get Bobby into my store? Known? He barked a laugh. You think I just randomly came into that nasty little store of yours? The opportunity was too good to pass up. All I had to do was get an anonymous message to Bobby promising incriminating information for his case against the Carringtons. An irrational flare of hurt tightened in my chest. Nasty little store? Randall had been nothing but supportive since I opened the doors at Happy Harvest Hydroponics. But it explained why Bobby had the address for my store in his pocket at the crime scene. So, what then? You have a habit of stalking the Carringtons and I just happened to turn up? I gripped the bench behind me, wishing there were more handy, sharp implements lying around. I provided the perfect opportunity to murder someone? Ah, cat. Randall extinguished his flame and tilted his head. There's more blood on Arthur Carrington's hands than mine. They really are bad news, I'm afraid. But getting charges to stick to a family where glamour runs strong is harder than it looks. You turning up here is rather a boon, come to think of it. Young Damon may slip the noose for Bobby's death, but after he kills his girlfriend? Well, the evidence will be far too compelling to ignore. Blood turned to ice in my veins. A shadow passed by the door, and for a second I hoped it was law enforcement. But nothing worked like that in the real world, did it? And the way it lurched, almost like, well, Randall took a step closer. Nothing to say to that, sweetheart? That was one of those moments where I would screech run at the TV screen. Even so, it took some convincing on my part to get my legs to cooperate. The exit was behind Randall, and orchid stands hemmed me in on either side. But the shadow was moving around the greenhouse, right about where I snuck in. As Randall closed the distance, I shoved the stand on the left to the floor, then scrambled over the one on the right, 
sending clay pellets and unearthed orchids flying. My sturdy boots carried me over the side, and when I landed on my shoulder, heaved the wreckage at Randall with my legs. He growled, and his gloating face turned to a snarl. I pushed myself up and hurled a pot at his head. There were two options. Hightail it to the door or the window. The shade cloth behind the window looked like it was about to tear, so I knocked over the last stand between me and the window and barreled into it with my tender shoulder. It didn't give as much as I'd hoped, and I frantically clasped the lever to wind it out further when a vice-like grip clamped my arm. With a pained cry, I turned as Randall wrenched me around. A slight cut above his eyebrow dripped crimson droplets down his nose. Nice try, cat, he flashed his teeth. Death by fire is rather unpleasant. You keep giving me a hard time, and I'll make sure the fire burns slow. Screwing my eyes shut, I waited for the worst. His hot breath on my face suffocated my senses, and the window lever cutting into my lower back only served as a reminder of how close I'd come to escape. Then the lever jolted inward, and my scream was drowned out by the sound of shattering glass on either side of the window. I opened my eyes just a crack in time to see two of Pete's traps clamp down on each of Randall's arms, and the look of surprise on his face afforded me precious seconds to duck under his arms and out of the fray. Pete's other three traps followed suit, hissing as they burst through the window where I'd been just moments before, and found fleshy spots to assault. My Dianea muscipula gigantis writhed like a creature from the deep, and I backed away in the direction where I hoped I hid my phone. Randall's cries sounded strangled as Pete splayed him in the air, and when I held my phone to my ear, I let go of a breath at the fuzzy sound of someone on the line. Cat? Detective Swan's voice was muted, like he was on Bluetooth. You there? We're on our way. Get out if you can and keep talking to me. I'm here. I sucked in deep breaths and made my way for the door, never taking my eyes off Randall and Pete. But just as I was trying to figure out what logical thing to say in that circumstance, smoke curled from Pete's traps, and a flicker of flame burst out of Randall's hand. Oh, sweet mother, there's going to be a fire, detective. I'm at Randall's house. Got it. We're about five minutes away, Cat. Get out of there right now, and we'll call it into the fire department. I nodded as stupid as that must have looked, and a tear rolled down my cheek. Whitish smoke, the kind you get when burning green leaves, swirled around Pete's traps, though the fly trap didn't look like he was about to let go. I let myself out of the greenhouse and closed the door shut firmly behind me, distraught at the notion that fire was slowly consuming my pride and joy, and there was nothing I could do about it. Five minutes was a long time, and I wasn't in a position to make bets on who would emerge victorious from the greenhouse. I stumbled around the side of the house and let myself through the unlocked gate, where I stared at Pete's discarded pot and trail of clay beads across the street. It was one thing enchanting him to recognize the killer on sight, quite the other to get him incensed to the point he'd uproot himself to rescue me. Neighbors stood out on their lawn, and I turned on my heel to stare at the plume of smoke rising into the sky. When an unmarked car pulled up at the front, I leaned against the fence and sagged. Detective Swan looked every inch the knight in shining armor, but Cruz was nowhere to be seen. Instead, a woman with flowing red hair and a sharp suit came up the driveway with her sidearm out and glanced at me with a wink before calling over her shoulder. Swan, make sure she's uninjured. I'm going in. Swan frowned and opened his mouth to speak, but the redhead barked, That's an order! There was something about the woman that had the hair on the back of my neck standing on end, and I flinched when Swan took me by the elbow and peered down at my face. Are you all right? Yeah, I made a nod. Who's that? Swan's eyebrows furrowed like he was trying to recall something. Cruz called in sick. Agent Alden called jurisdiction on the case. Alden? While I was caring a lot less for coincidences these days, that name sent a shiver of fear right down to my toes. She had to be an inquisitor. The Aldens were a large and influential family in the magical community. Grandma always said they bred like rabbits. Sirens blaring in the background got close, 
and when the flashing lights became visible, Swan escorted me to the front porch to let the firefighters pull in and get to work. I quietly considered the man who looked flummoxed at the whole situation and felt shamed for being party to his mind being magically messed with twice in a week. I saw the cogs turning in his head, and when he screwed up his face like he was on the verge of understanding, his features went blank again. He rubbed the bridge of his nose, then blinked at me. So I suppose you must be glad your boyfriend's off the hook? My boyfriend? I didn't have to look at my phone to remember the words in that text. I thought they would be etched into my brain for the rest of eternity. He isn't my boyfriend anymore. Chapter 10 It didn't take long for the fire department to get things under control. After Agent Alden handed an unscathed Randall to Detective Swan to put in the back of their vehicle, she remained with me on the porch with her hands in her pockets. Won't he just incinerate the car? I folded my arms, watching as Swan pushed Randall's head down to guide him into the back seat. Those are magical grade cuffs, and Silas will be going to a special cell. I frowned at Alden, and she broke into a wide grin. Silas Groom has evaded the Inquisitors for decades. This kind of arrest is going to look good on my resume. She pursed her lips at my confusion. He's been wanted since the 80s, when he used a charmed bomb to breach the council's vault. Six witches and warlocks died that day. Randall Lockhart was a wanted criminal named Silas. I swallowed, only faintly recalling that attack mentioned by Grandma. How do you know it was him? Looked up Randall after reading the file. No mugshot on record, of course, but there was a photo of him on an Orchid Society website. It was a match with our records. That didn't answer the question of why she became involved, but I supposed it wasn't my business to ask. Randall, uh, Silas said he was set up by, we've suspected for a long time that the Carringtons were involved. If he cooperates, she shrugged. You wouldn't let him walk, would you? I gasped. Nah, but special privileges inside look real appealing when you're in for life. Not active in the magical community indeed. He was a fugitive. I sighed and turned to look at the gate. Is Pete, my flytrap? Gone, Alden confirmed, along with that screeching orchid. I closed misty eyes and sniffed, then felt a comforting hand on my shoulder. You should really be more careful. Your grandma had me look into this break-in as a favor. While I should really report this, she's done me plenty of services over the years. Aha, uh -huh. I should have figured grandma would find a way to exert her influence. But if she hadn't, I may have very well ended up in a lot more trouble. What do I do now? The words escaped my mouth, though I didn't expect Alden to answer them. Looks like you've got some big decisions to make. It won't take long for the Carringtons to find out we have Silas in custody. She gave my shoulder a squeeze. If it were me, I wouldn't want to be in the firing line when that happens. I only nodded, and Alden strode to the car. I wondered absently how much magic it took to perform a cover-up of this magnitude, and if Swan would have a thumping headache come morning. Once the detectives traded words with uniformed officers recently arrived, they pulled away from the curb, with Silas glaring at me from the back seat. Firefighters still milled around the scene, and even if I wanted to, I wasn't sure if I could go back into that greenhouse to say goodbye to Pete's charred remains. Instead, I picked up his pot and most of the clay pellets off the street and walked mechanically back to the van. The back was open, and when I tried to close it, the latch didn't quite click. An old woman across the road glared at me suspiciously. I gulped, then used a strap as a temporary measure to keep the door closed. Pete must have looked quite the sight bursting from the van. When I climbed in and gripped the steering wheel, the last place I wanted to go was home, but I needed to go pick up Gus and my things, and if Damon happened to be there, at least I'd see the look on his face when I confronted him about the text. Each mile I covered swelled the anger simmering in my belly. Long nights at the office, doing laundry out of the blue, ghosting my calls and texts for hours at a time, then to have the nerve to be gone an entire night and show up in the morning begging my forgiveness. Tires screeched on the concrete of the underground garage below our apartment. 
I slammed the door and marched up the stairwell with my fists bunched. The door was locked, but after busting in, I found him curled up in bed snoring after his big night out. Gus rubbed up against my leg and I put my hands on my hips as I stared at the guy I'd moved thousands of miles from home to be with. What is it? Are we going? Tell me we're going. If I have to listen to that wretched snoring for another minute, I'm liable to scratch his eyes out. Gus leaped up onto the bed between me and Damon. Yes, we're going, I announced, then grabbed a suitcase from the wardrobe to toss onto the bed. It had the desired effect, and Damon lurched up in bed and blinked sleepy eyes. Cat, what, what are you doing? I have good news for you. I flashed my teeth in a vindictive smile. You're in the clear on that police situation. Now you can go be with whoever this text was intended for. I wiggled my phone in his direction and waited for the other shoe to drop. His face fell and I huffed and shook my head. Wait, he held up a hand. I can explain. I don't want any more of your bulldust explanations, Damon. I'm leaving and that's all there is to it. Now that's what I'm talking about, Gus purred. Told you he was a jerk. Nervous laughter escaped my lips, and Damon frowned at Gus even though he couldn't hear his remarks. Please, just let me make a coffee. We can sit down and talk about this. Coffee? My voice was shrill. Sure, you go make a coffee. Just make sure mine is to go. It'll be a long drive back to Arkansas. Damon dragged a hand over his face, but flipped back the covers and brushed past me as he headed out to the kitchen. I stuffed the luggage case with everything of mine that came to hand, mentally writing off anything in the laundry or I'd forgotten as collateral damage. I had to push my elbow down on the lid after stuffing my laptop and charger in, but got it zipped and dragged it down from the bed. Gus paced ahead of me into the living room, and I stopped short of the kitchen where Damon stood to unwind the apartment key off my keychain. I tossed it onto the coffee table with an arched eyebrow, and Damon took a deep breath. I'm sorry, Cat. I never meant- No. I shook my head. You never mean anything, Damon. It's all just a web of lies that you smear around with your magic. I'm not sure even you know the truth anymore. You were with whoever she is the night of the murder. Bobby's lawyer, Damon puffed out his cheeks. Christine! Well, ain't that just poetic? Are you going to say you weren't lying now? I rolled my eyes and huffed. Don't answer that, I don't want to hear it. Gus scratched at the door, so I hefted my suitcase and took his lead. Damon moved to intercept me, and I flashed my teeth in a snarl. Get out of the way, Damon. You better get on the phone to Daddy and let him know the Inquisitors have Silas Groom in custody. His face blanched, and that was all the confirmation I needed. I pushed past him, the wheels on the suitcase bumping over his bare feet, and I felt an unreasonable surge of gratification at his discomfort. Slamming the door on the way out, I got to the business of wrangling the suitcase down the stairs with Gus cackling all the way. After getting both unwieldy luggage and maniacal feline into the van, I screeched out of the garage headed east. Gus at least had the good sense not to gloat on the way back to the store, and I only stopped long enough to grab what remained of my magical plants and computer. Standing in the middle of the store, I unwound another key with a sigh and pushed down a deep wave of regret at abandoning the first thing that was ever really all mine. The responsible thing to do would be to check into a motel until I could get my business affairs in order. But I couldn't bring myself to stay in California a minute longer. I ached for the scent of the mountains back home, the sound of mom's voice, knowing that the people who had my back were all within reach. I could arrange for someone to empty out the store, maybe find a buyer on the internet which would recoup at least some losses. It didn't matter nearly as much as it would have a week ago. I left the key with the owner of the Chinese takeout next door and she promised with a nod to keep an eye on things for me. When I got back in the van, Gus reached a tentative paw to lightly claw my thigh. Are you okay? His feline eyes pierced mine and as my mouth twisted, he hopped on my lap. He was cheating on me, Gus. How stupid was I for not even noticing the red flags? Gus smooched his cheek against my chest. I told you he stank of lies. You didn't want to hear it. His smooching suddenly rubbed me the wrong way, and I picked him up around the chest to bring his face to eye level. 
Gus, did you know he was seeing another woman? The perfume was hideous. Gus sneezed. I can never unsmell it. Gritting my teeth, I placed my traitorous familiar back on the passenger seat and fired up the van. It's a long way home to Arkansas, Gus. I think we need to have a long talk on the subject of full disclosure on the way. You told me to shut up, Gus protested. This is not how the witch-familiar relationship is supposed to work. You're supposed to warn me about this kind of stuff. I pulled out onto the street and gripped the wheel tight. And you're supposed to heed my warnings. The words sunk in, and I heaved a deep breath as I considered the times I was too busy to take his griping seriously. When I dismissed his complaints as a stubborn refusal to adjust to a new lifestyle, I was so committed to starting a brand new life, perhaps I'd forgotten to hold on to the parts of my old life worth keeping. I'm sorry, Gus. I merged onto the highway where the landscape opened up, almost beckoning me home. I'm sorry, too, he sighed. I'm going to miss Mimi, though. Mimi? I gave Gus the side eye. I thought you two were done. Humans, he scoffed. It's always so final with your sort. Mimi was coming around. She may have been playing hardball, but she knew a fine feline specimen when she saw one. I snorted with laughter, and it felt good. The tears of humor prickling my eyes may have been at odds with the upheaval of the past week, but my entire body felt lighter. The laughter soon turned to cackling, and though Gus gave me a weird look, I held nothing back. It was like stepping out of the twilight zone back into the real world, and I never felt happier to be on the way home. Thank you so much for joining me on this enchanting journey through a flytrap fiasco. I hope you enjoyed the magical escapade as much as I did. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of future mystical tales. Let me know in the comments what you thought of the story. Before you go, give this video a thumbs up if you found the tale bewitching. And as always, may your books be filled with wonder and your days with enchantment.